So for this lesson, we're going to talk about Chapter 1, Section 1, the Gilded Age and the Progressive Movement. All right, the big idea here is from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, the Progressive Movement addressed problems in American society. This Progressive Movement really set out to address some of those major issues that we've talked about in the past. Uh, it Definitely during this time, you see a major difference between the wealthy business owners in America and the working class. There's a huge divide between those two groups. And in order to bring that divide smaller, um, they turn to the government. Now, in true capitalism, this, this divide does happen. It's inevitable. Um, but that's why, just like any other economic model, capitalism has its flaws. And that flaw tends to be humans. Humans mess up everything. Uh, we're selfish. We, we Socialism, communism, capitalism, any kind of ism of economics when you add humans to it, the perfect utopia idea of it becomes a problem. So <coughs> they turned to government. During this time, you had the rise of what's known as political machines. And now political machines are basically organizations that just basically strongly influence all the city and county and federal politics in the late 1800s. We still have political machines today. They're nothing what we once had, but we think of like the Clintons. We say, oh, the Clinton political machine. Okay, and this is what it's talking about. It's using strong organization to influence politics. Back then, they used both legal and illegal means to get their candidate elected to public office. Right now, we have seen that in the last several elections that you have these political machines, typically big money, uh, that are doing their best to organize in, uh, in as legal as possible or as illegal as possible really um, to get their way uh, back then you, these political machines would stuff ballot boxes with votes they'd have people walk in there and vote 10 times they they would pay people to vote with bribes or they would bribe the vote counters they'd go in and say hey i'll give you uh, ten thousand dollars if you say that uh, my candidate got more votes all right, and they were the leaders of these machines were often called the bosses, and they traded favors for votes. Essentially, uh, these political machines became very popular with immigrants and poor families, mostly because um, they offered them services. Uh, if you've ever seen a mob movie, you know they come in and they ask the shop owner, "Hey, where's your protection payment?" Right? That kind of all started back then because basically, you had. Um, a very small police presence. The police were, were not super well organized with some of this organized crime stuff. Uh, and so these political machines would say, hey, you vote for us, you pay your dues, you pay us, we'll provide any kind of social service you want, uh, especially in rural areas where there weren't really fire departments. There weren't uh, big police departments. They would say, hey, if your business catches on fire, we guarantee that we'll have some people come and put the fire out faster than the city will. And so it was very popular. Also, they allowed immigrants and poor people to join, which immigrants and poor people really felt like they were being left out of the, the American political system. Um, the supporters of these political machines were given government jobs. You vote for me, you organize, you work hard for the political system. We'll give you whatever job you want in government because the government jobs paid a lot of money. And so they'd say, hey, you vote for us, then we're going to give you um, whatever, the inspector's job or whatever, the fire marshal. That would be all the friends of these people. Most notorious political machine was New York City's Tammany Hall. Uh, it was headed by a guy named William Marcy Tweed. Um, when, in New York City, in 1888, the Tammany Hall candidate won office. And as a result of that, 12,000 jobs were awarded to people that had donated to the Tammany Hall political machine. 12,000 jobs of just friends and family and relatives and supporters. Um, they estimate that William Marcy Tweed may have even stolen through this method over $200 million from the city itself by basically giving contracts for a million dollars to his friends for jobs that cost $500,000, and then they would complete the job and the leftover money, they'd just give it to Tammany Hall, and they donated it back. It was uh, corruption, money laundering. 
Uh, even the administration of Ulysses S. Grant had problems with this. Um, he was elected in 68, re-elected in 72, and his administration was charged with corrupt corruption. During the second term, they actually had federal officials that were jailed for taking bribes from whiskey distillers. They'd go in and they'd say, hey, whiskey company, if you um, give us, so your tax bill is a million dollars this year, you give us $500,000 and we'll go in and say that you paid your million dollar tax. So they just pocket that $500,000 and they got arrested and put in jail for it. And obviously those things led to the vast majority of regular working class Americans to question national leaders. Um, you even had Congress taking railroad companies money uh, for heads up, basically like insider trading. They'd say, hey, this is land that's going to be sold to the railroad company. The government's going to take this land. We're going to sell it for this amount of money, you know. Uh, and so they'd give a heads up. Those people would go and buy the land that the government was going to pay for. So let's say the government was going to buy it for $10 an acre. They'd go to the landowners and say, hey, I'll buy this land for $5 an acre because they knew what was coming and the general population didn't. Then, when the government came in, they double their money. Rutherford B. Hayes uh, gets elected president from 1877. He promises radical changes, uh, but he, and he made some minor reforms, and, and one of those was he fired a very powerful member of the New York political machine that had gotten a lot of influence and a lot of power. Garfield, in 1881, tried reform, but um, the workers were so upset with him that a federal officer actually um, killed him, shot him, killed him. Um, Chester Arthur, his vice president, becomes president. He backed the Pendleton Civil Service Act, which basically set up the modern system of awarding federal money, which was a merit-based system. Once you got one and once you got one contract and proved that you can fill it and that you do so efficiently and without corruption, then that puts you higher on the list to get the next one. And so basically it becomes a situation where companies that have gotten a lot of government contracts are able to get more government contracts because they've proven that they aren't corrupt. Benjamin Harrison then gets elected, 89 to 93. He helped control inflation. He also passed the Sherman Antitrust Act, which became very, very popular amongst people because it basically said, we're gonna break up monopolies. And then William McKinley, uh, avoids complete, completely avoided any scandal, gets a lot of public trust back in the government. So who were the progressives? They were reformers. They helped to solve problems caused by rapid industrial and urban growth. They wanted to eliminate causes of crime and disease and poverty. They wanted to ease overcrowding. They wanted to advocate for better education. They promoted better living conditions uh, and less child labor. They fought corruption. And they were greatly helped by a group named, called muck rakers. These muckrakers were journalists who basically saw a problem in society and then wrote about it through newspapers and magazine articles in order to bring attention to it. It influenced a lot of voters, specifically that weren't living in the big cities, of what was happening in those cities with corruption and bad living conditions, and it changed a lot of people's minds. Um, Lincoln Steffens was one. He wrote a series of articles exposing corruption in city government. Uh, Ida B. Tarbell uh, criticized the practices of Standard Oil, and, and that ultimately led to the uh, Standard Oil being prosecuted under the Antitrust Act and being broken up. And then Upton Sinclair exposed a lot of unsanitary practices in the meat processing industry in his uh, book, The Jungle. Progressives also started settlement houses, such as Jane Addams' Hull House. You end up with progressive city planners who design safer building codes. They open new public parks. You have civil and sanitation engineers that improve transportation in cities. They address pollution and sanitation issues, most specifically getting rid of waste and access to clean water. Most of these tenement houses didn't have access to clean water. They didn't have a way to, they didn't have plumbing. They had no toilets, so they just pooped in a bucket and threw it out the window onto the street. And they couldn't wash their hands, they didn't have clean water, so you had a lot of disease and stuff in the water. Um, where these city planners and civil engineers addressed these issues, you see huge death rates drop, which is good, obviously. They, uh, progressive also believed in improving education and that that would lead to a better society. 
So you end up with a lot of education reform, uh, school attendance laws. This is where we get truancy laws and stuff, the earliest of the truancy laws. Uh, one major advocate was a woman named Susan Blow who saw a need. The need was children being educated. Imagine that. She opened the very first public kindergarten in 1873 in St. Louis where kids didn't have to pay to go to kindergarten. Within 25 years, more than 4,000 kindergartens have been opened in the United States. Then you have a guy named John Dewey. He advocates a new teaching method designed to help children learn problem-solving skills, not just memorize facts. Uh, this becomes a major model for early education. The whole, uh, if you look in your textbooks or you've ever had to answer a critical thinking question, that was kind of under the basis of John Dewey. He said, hey, you can't just memorize facts, you know, and, and that's true because today, memorizing facts is useless. You, you can Google facts. What you can't Google is how to think about those facts. Um, and he said that's more important than just the facts themselves. And then you have Joseph McCormack. Uh, lead, he started the AMA, the American Medical Association. And this helped organize doctors and researchers from all around the country to solve some of the biggest health issues in the United States. You also have progressives that work to reduce the power of political machines. They end corrupt ballot practices. They adopt the secret ballot, which is the idea that who you vote for is your business. Before that, you'd have to go in and you'd have to stand in front of some of the roughest, toughest, meanest people from, say, Tammany Hall in New York. And they're looking at you and they go, okay, who do you vote for? And if you said the wrong guy, your business might get burned down. Um, so it was, it was influenced by intimidation. They also adopted the direct primary. They wanted people to be directly involved in electing some members of the government. Um, the 17th Amendment really took this to the next step, which said, hey, you actually get to vote for your own U.S. senators. Before that, there was kind of like an electoral college kind of feel to electing senators, but not after the 17th Amendment. Who you vote for is who you vote for, period. The last three major reforms were the introduction of three types of voting practices. The first was called a recall vote. This is uh, a lot of states adopted a recall vote, which gave them the ability to recall somebody that had been elected to office. Um, you go in, you vote, you say, hey, they're doing a terrible job, they're corrupt, we want to get rid of them. You get enough signatures on a ballot, you go in, and you get to hold another vote whether they get to stay in office. Uh, Louisiana does this. We've had uh, a recall petition against John Bell Edwards this year. I don't think it's gonna, it didn't go through or anything, didn't get enough signatures, but we have that option. California with uh, recalls people all the time. It's crazy there. It's the Wild West out there in California. But then you have the initiative vote, which is basically um, if the legislature won't get a uh, law passed that the public thinks that they should, um, then you can start an initiative, which is where basically the people straight up vote on new laws. Uh, Louisiana has this as, as well. They have the initiative. Uh, one example would be uh, the uh, sports betting initiative, where people living in that area got to, got to vote whether or not sports betting would be allowed. They did not leave it up to the legislator. And then the last one is the referendum. And the referendum, it basically says if there is a, a law that has been put in place by the legislature and the people don't agree with it in large amounts, they can do a referendum, which basically says, no, we don't accept that law, get it off the books. All right. In big cities, you have city man council managers form, gov form a government in which professional city manager runs it. Other cities adopt a commission form of government where a group of elected officials run the city instead of just one single mayor. And in certain states, uh, particularly uh, Wisconsin, Governor Robert M. Uh, La La Follette, uh, and that's probably not it. I mean, they're Midwestern, so I'm giving it some uh, French twang there. Um, challenged the power of political bosses, and he started a series of reforms called the Wisconsin Idea, where it decreased the power of the political machines, and then lots of other ideas take the, the other states, take the Wisconsin Idea, and implement it in their states as well. That concludes Section 1.